man, the rational being he is born able to create, but must create by choice. That the first precondition of self-esteem is that radiant selfishness of soul which desires the best in all things, in values of matter and spirit, a soul that seeks above all else to achieve its own moral perfection, valuing nothing higher than itself, and that the proof of an achieved self-esteem is your soul's shudder of contempt and rebellion against the role of a sacrificial animal, against the vile impertinence of any creed that proposes to immolate the irreplaceable value which is your consciousness and the incomparable glory which is your existence, the blind evasions and the stagnant decay of others. Are you beginning to see who is John Galt? I am the man who has earned the thing you did not fight for, the thing you have renounced, betrayed, corrupted, yet were unable fully to destroy and are now hiding as your guilty secret, spending your life in apologies to every professional cannibal, lest it be discovered that somewhere within you you still long to say what I am now saying to the hearing of the whole of mankind. I am proud of my own value and of the fact that I wish to live. This wish which you share, yet submerge as an evil, is the only remnant of the good within you. But it is a wish one must learn to deserve. His own happiness is man's only moral purpose, but only his own virtue can achieve it. Virtue is not an end in itself. Virtue is not its own reward or sacrificial fodder for the reward of evil. Life is the reward of virtue, and happiness is the goal and the reward of life. Just as your body has two fundamental sensations, pleasure and pain, as signs of its welfare or injury, as a barometer of its basic alternative, life or death, so your consciousness has two fundamental emotions, joy and suffering, in answer to the same alternative. Your emotions are estimates of that which furthers your life or threatens it, lightning calculators, giving you a sum of your profit or loss. You have no choice about your capacity to feel that something is good for you or evil. But what you will consider good or evil, what will give you joy or pain, what you will love or hate, desire or fear, depends on your standard of value. Emotions are inherent in your nature, but their content is dictated by your mind. Your emotional capacity is an empty motor and your values are the fuel with which your mind fills it. If you choose a mix of contradictions, it will clog your motor, corrode your transmission, and wreck you on your first attempt to move with a machine which you, the driver, have corrupted. If you hold the irrational as your standard of value, and the impossible as your concept of the good, if you long for rewards you have not earned, for a fortune or a love you don't deserve, for a loophole in the law of causality, for an A that becomes non-A at your whim, if you desire the opposite of existence, you will reach it. Do not cry when you reach it. That life is frustration, and that happiness is impossible to man. Check your fuel. It brought you where you wanted to go. Happiness is not to be achieved at the command of emotional whims. Happiness is not the satisfaction of whatever irrational wishes you might blindly attempt to indulge. Happiness is a state of non-contradictory joy, a joy without penalty or guilt, a joy that does not clash with any of your values and does not work for your own destruction. Not the joy of escaping from your mind, but of using your mind's fullest power. Not the joy of faking reality, but of achieving values that are real. Not the joy of a drunkard, but of a producer. Happiness is possible only to a rational man. The man who desires nothing but rational goals, seeks nothing but rational values, and finds his joy in nothing but rational actions. Just as I support my life, neither by robbery nor alms, but by my own effort, so I do not seek to derive my happiness from the injury or the favor of others, but earn it by my own achievement. Just as I do not consider the pleasure of others as the goal of my life, so I do not consider my pleasure as the goal of the lives of others. Just as there are no contradictions in my values and no conflicts among my desires, so there are no victims and no conflicts of interest among rational men, men who do not desire the unearned and do not view one another with a cannibal's lust, men who neither make sacrifices nor accept them. The symbol of all relationships among such men 
the moral symbol of respect for human beings, is the trader. We who live by values, not by loot, are traders, both in matter and in spirit. A trader is a man who earns what he gets and does not give or take the undeserved. A trader does not ask to be paid for his failures, nor does he ask to be loved for his flaws. A trader does not squander his body as fodder or his soul as alms. Just as he does not give his work except in trade for material values, so he does not give the values of his spirit, his love, his friendship, his esteem, except in payment and in trade for human virtues, in payment for his own selfish pleasure, which he receives from men he can respect. The mystic parasites who have throughout the ages reviled the traders and held them in contempt, while honoring the beggars and the looters, have known the secret motive of their sneers. A traitor is the entity they dread, a man of justice. Do you ask what moral obligation I owe to my fellow men? None, except the obligation I owe to myself, to material objects, and to all of existence. Rationality. I deal with men as my nature and theirs demands, by means of reason. I seek or desire nothing from them except such relations as they care to enter of their own voluntary choice. It is only with their mind that I can deal, and only for my own self-interest, when they see that my interest coincides with theirs. When they don't, I enter no relationships. I let dissenters go their way, and I do not swerve from mine. I win by means of nothing but logic, and I surrender to nothing but logic. I do not surrender my reason or deal with men who surrender theirs. I have nothing to gain from fools or cowards. I have no benefits to seek from human vices, from stupidity, dishonesty, or fear. The only value men can offer me is the work of their mind. When I disagree with a rational man, I let reality be our final arbiter. If I am right, he will learn. If I am wrong, I will. One of us will win, but both will profit. Whatever may be open to disagreement, there is one act of evil that may not. The act that no man may commit against others and no man may sanction or forgive. So long as men desire to live together, no man may initiate. Do you hear me? No man may start the use of physical force against others. To interpose the threat of physical destruction between a man and his perception of reality is to negate and paralyze his means of survival. To force him to act against his own judgment is like forcing him to act against his own sight. Whoever, to whatever purpose or extent, initiates the use of force is a killer acting on the premise of death in a manner wider than murder, the premise of destroying man's capacity to live. Do not open your mouth to tell me that your mind has convinced you of your right to force my mind. Force and mind are opposites. Morality ends where a gun begins. When you declare that men are irrational animals and propose to treat them as such, you define thereby your own character and can no longer claim the sanction of reason as no advocate of contradictions can claim. There can be no right to destroy the source of rights, the only means of judging right or wrong, the mind. To force a man to drop his own mind and to accept your will as a substitute with a gun in place of a syllogism, with terror in place of proof and death as the final argument, is to attempt to exist in defiance of reality. Reality demands of man that he act for his own rational interest, your gun demands of him that he act against. Reality threatens man with death if he does not act on his rational judgment. You threaten him with death if he does. You place him into a world where the price of his life is the surrender of all the virtues required by life. And death, by a process of gradual destruction, is all that you and your system will achieve. When death is made to be the ruling power, the winning argument in a society of men, be it a highwayman who confronts a traveler with the ultimatum, your money or your life, or a politician who confronts a country with the ultimatum, your children's education or your life. The meaning of that ultimatum is, your mind or your life. And neither is possible to a man without the other. If there are degrees of evil, it is hard to say who is the more contemptible, the brute who assumes the right to force the mind of others, or the moral degenerate who grants to others the right to force his mind. That is the moral absolute one does not leave open to debate. I do not grant the terms of reason to men who propose to deprive me of reason. 
I do not enter discussions with neighbors who think they can forbid me to think. I do not place my moral sanction upon a murderer's wish to kill me. When a man attempts to deal with me by force, I answer him by force. It is only as retaliation that force may be used, and only against the man who starts its use. No, I do not share his evil or sink to his concept of morality. I merely grant him his choice, destruction, the only destruction he had the right to choose, his own. He uses force to seize a value. I use it only to destroy destruction. A hold-up man seeks to gain wealth by killing me. I do not grow richer by killing a hold-up man. I seek no values by means of evil, nor do I surrender my values to evil. In the name of all the producers who have kept you alive and received your death ultimatums in payment, I now answer you with the single ultimatum of our own. Our work or your guns. You can choose either. You can't have both. We do not initiate the use of force against others or submit to force at their hands. If you desire ever again to live in an industrial society, it will be on our moral terms. Our terms and our motive power are the antithesis of yours. You have been using fear as your weapon and have been bringing death to man as his punishment for rejecting your morality. We offer him life as his reward for accepting ours. You who are worshippers of the zero, you have never discovered that achieving life is not the equivalent of avoiding death. Joy is not the absence of pain. Intelligence is not the absence of stupidity. Light is not the absence of darkness. An entity is not the absence of a non-entity. Building is not done by abstaining from demolition. Centuries of sitting and waiting in such abstinence will not raise one single girder for you to abstain from demolishing. And now you can no longer say to me, the builder, produce and feed us in exchange for our not destroying your production. I am answering in the name of all your victims, perish with and in your own void. Existence is not a negation of negatives. Evil, not value, is an absence and a negation. Evil is impotent and has no power but that which we let it extort from us. Perish, because we have learned that a zero cannot hold a mortgage over life. You seek escape from pain. We seek the achievement of happiness. You exist for the sake of avoiding punishment. We exist for the sake of earning rewards. Threats will not make us function. Fear is not our incentive. It is not death that we wish to avoid but life that we wish to live. You who have lost the concept of the difference, you who claim that fear and joy are incentives of equal power, and secretly add that fear is the more practical, you do not wish to live, and only fear of death still holds you to the existence you have damned. You dart in panic through the trap of your days, looking for the exit you have closed, running from a pursuer you dare not name to a terror you dare not acknowledge. And the greater your terror the greater your dread of the only act that could save you. Thinking. The purpose of your struggle is not to know, not to grasp or name or hear the thing I shall now state to your hearing, that yours is the morality of death. Death is the standard of your values. Death is your chosen goal. And you have to keep running since there is no escape from the pursuer who is out to destroy you, or from the knowledge that that pursuer is yourself. You Stop running for once. There is no place to run. Stand naked, as you dread to stand, but as I see you. And take a look at what you dared to call a moral code. Damnation is the start of your morality. Destruction is its purpose, means, and end. Your code begins by damning man as evil then demands that he practice a good which it defines as impossible for him to practice. It demands as his first proof of virtue that he accept his own depravity without proof. It demands that he start not with the standard of value, but with the standard of evil, which is himself, by means of which he is then to define the good. The good is that which he is not. It does not matter who then becomes the profiteer on his renounced glory and tormented soul, a mystic god with some incomprehensible design, or any passerby whose rotting sores are held as some inexplicable claim upon him. It does not matter. The good is not for him to understand. 
his duty is to crawl through years of penance, atoning for the guilt of his existence to any stray collector of unintelligible debts. His only concept of a value is a zero. The good is that which is non-man. The name of this monstrous absurdity is original sin. A sin without volition is a slap at morality and an insolent contradiction in terms. That which is outside the possibility of choice is outside the province of morality. If man is evil by birth, he has no will, no power to change it. If he has no will, he can be neither good nor evil. A robot is amoral. To hold as man's sin, a fact not open to his choice, is a mockery of morality. To hold man's nature as his sin is a mockery of nature. To punish him for a crime he committed before he was born is a mockery of justice. To hold him guilty in a matter where no innocence exists is a mockery of reason. To destroy morality, nature, justice, and reason by means of a single concept is a feat of evil hardly to be matched. Yet that is the root of your code. Do not hide behind the cowardly evasion that man is born with free will but with a tendency to evil. A free will saddled with a tendency is like a game with loaded dice. It forces man to struggle through the effort of playing, to bear responsibility and pay for the game. But the decision is weighted in favor of a tendency that he had no power to escape. If the tendency is of his choice, he cannot possess it at birth. If it is not of his choice, his will is not free. What is the nature of the guilt that your teachers call his original sin? What are the evils man acquired when he fell from a state they consider perfection? Their myth declares that he ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge. He acquired a mind and became a rational being. It was the knowledge of good and evil. He became a moral being. He was sentenced to earn his bread by his labor. He became a productive being. He was sentenced to experience desire. He acquired the capacity of sexual enjoyment. The evils for which they damn him are reason, morality, creativeness, joy all the cardinal values of his existence. It is not his vices that their myth of man's fall is designed to explain and condemn. It is not his errors that they hold as his guilt, but the essence of his nature as man. Whatever he was, that robot in the Garden of Eden who existed without mind, without values, without labor, without love, he was not man. Man's fall, according to your teachers, was that he gained the virtues required to live. These virtues, by their standard, are his sin. His evil, they charge, is that he's man. His guilt, they charge, is that he lives. They call it a morality of mercy and a doctrine of love for man. No, they say they do not preach that man is evil. The evil is only that alien object, his body. No, they say they do not wish to kill him. They only wish to make him lose his body. They seek to help him, they say, against his pain. And they point at the torture rack to which they've tied him. The rack with two wheels that pull him in opposite directions. The rack of the doctrine that splits his soul and body. They have cut man in two, setting one half against the other. They have taught him that his body and his consciousness are two enemies engaged in deadly conflict. Two antagonists of opposite natures, contradictory claims, incompatible needs that to benefit one is to injure the other, that his soul belongs to a supernatural realm, but his body is an evil prison, holding it in bondage to this earth, and that the good is to defeat his body, to undermine it by years of patient struggle, digging his way to that glorious jailbreak, which leads into the freedom of the grave. They have taught man that he is a hopeless misfit, made of two elements, both symbols of death, a body without a soul, is a corpse, a soul without a body is a ghost. Yet such is their image of man's nature, the battleground of a struggle between a corpse and a ghost, a corpse endowed with some evil volition of its own, and a ghost endowed with the knowledge that everything known to man is non-existent, that only the unknowable exists. Do you observe what human faculty that doctrine was designed to ignore? It was man's mind that had to be negated in order to make him fall apart. Once he surrendered reason, he was left at the mercy of two monsters whom he could not fathom or control, of a body moved by unaccountable instincts, 
and of a soul moved by mystic revelations. He was left as the passively ravaged victim of a battle between a robot and a dictaphone. And as he now crawls through the wreckage, groping blindly for a way to live, your teachers offer him the help of a morality that proclaims that he'll find no solution and must seek no fulfillment on earth. Real existence, they tell him, is that which he cannot perceive. True consciousness is the faculty of perceiving the non-existent. And if he is unable to understand it, that is the proof that his existence is evil and his consciousness impotent. As products of the split between man's soul and body, there are two kinds of teachers of the morality of death, the mystics of spirit and the mystics of muscle, whom you call the spiritualists and the materialists, those who believe in consciousness without existence and those who believe in existence without consciousness. Both demand the surrender of your mind, one to their revelations, the other to their reflexes. No matter how loudly they posture in the roles of irreconcilable antagonists, their moral codes are alike, and so are their aims. In matter, the enslavement of man's body. In spirit, the destruction of his mind. The good, say the mystics of spirit, is God, a being whose only definition is that he is beyond man's power to conceive, a definition that invalidates man's consciousness and nullifies his concepts of existence. The good, say the mystics of muscle, is society, a thing which they define as an organism that possesses no physical form, a super-being, embodied in no one in particular, and everyone in general, except yourself. Man's mind, say the mystics of spirit, must be subordinated to the will of God. Man's mind, say the mystics of muscle, must be subordinated to the will of society. Man's standard of value, say the mystics of spirit, is the pleasure of God whose standards are beyond man's power of comprehension and must be accepted on faith. Man's standard of value, say the mystics of muscle, is the pleasure of society, whose standards are beyond man's right of judgment and must be obeyed as a primary absolute. The purpose of man's life, say both, is to become an abject zombie who serves a purpose he does not know for reasons he is not to question. His reward, say the mystics of spirit, will be given to him beyond the grave. His reward, say the mystics of muscle, will be given on earth to his great-grandchildren. Selfishness, say both, is man's evil. Man's good, say both, is to give up his personal desire, to deny himself, renounce himself, surrender. Man's good is to negate the life he lives. Sacrifice, cry both, is the essence of morality, the highest virtue within man's reach. Whoever is now within reach of my voice, whoever is man the victim, not man the killer, I am speaking at the deathbed of your mind, at the brink of that darkness in which you are drowning. And if there still remains within you the power to struggle to hold on to those fading sparks which had been yourself, use it now. The word that has destroyed you is sacrifice. Use the last of your strength to understand its meaning. You're still alive. You have a chance. Sacrifice does not mean the rejection of the worthless, but of the precious. Sacrifice does not mean the rejection of the evil for the sake of the good, but of the good for the sake of the evil. Sacrifice is the surrender of that which you value in favor of that which you don't. If you exchange a penny for a dollar, it is not a sacrifice. If you exchange a dollar for a penny, it is. If you achieve the career you wanted after years of struggle, it is not a sacrifice. If you then renounce it for the sake of a rival, it is. If you own a bottle of milk and give it to your starving child, it is not a sacrifice. If you give it to your neighbor's child and let your own die, it is. If you give money to help a friend, it is not a sacrifice. If you give it to a worthless stranger, it is. If you give your friend the sum you can afford, it is not a sacrifice. If you give him money at the cost of your own discomfort, it is only a partial virtue according to this sort of moral standard. If you give him money at the cost of disaster to yourself, that is the virtue of sacrifice in full. If you renounce all personal desires and dedicate your life to those you love, you do not achieve full virtue. 
you still retain a value of your own, which is your love. If you devote your life to random strangers, it is an act of greater virtue. If you devote your life to serving men you hate, that is the greatest of the virtues you can practice. A sacrifice is the surrender of a value. Full sacrifice is full surrender of all values. If you wish to achieve full virtue, you must seek no gratitude in return for your sacrifice, no praise, no love, no admiration, no self-esteem, not even the pride of being virtuous. The faintest trace of any gain dilutes your virtue. If you pursue a course of action that does not taint your life by any joy, that brings you no value in matter, no value in spirit, no gain, no profit, no reward, if you achieve this state of total zero, you have achieved the ideal of moral perfection. You are told that moral perfection is impossible to man, and by this standard it is. You cannot achieve it so long as you live, but the value of your life and of your person is gauged by how closely you succeed in approaching that ideal zero, which is death. If you start, however, as a passionless blank, as a vegetable seeking to be eaten with no values to reject and no wishes to renounce, you will not win the crown of sacrifice. It is not a sacrifice to renounce the unwanted. It is not a sacrifice to give your life for others if death is your personal desire. To achieve the virtue of sacrifice, you must want to live, you must love it. You must burn with passion for this earth and for all the splendor it can give you. You must feel the twist of every knife as it slashes your desires away from your reach and drains your love out of your body. It is not mere death that the morality of sacrifice holds out to you as an ideal, but death by slow torture. Do not remind me that it pertains only to this life on earth. I am concerned with no other. Neither are you. If you wish to save the last of your dignity, do not call your best actions a sacrifice. That term brands you as immoral. If a mother buys food for her hungry child rather than a hat for herself, it is not a sacrifice. She values the child higher than the hat. But it is a sacrifice to the kind of mother whose higher value is the hat, who would prefer her child to starve and feeds him only from a sense of duty. If a man dies fighting for his own freedom, it is not a sacrifice. He is not willing to live as a slave. But it is a sacrifice to the kind of man who is willing. If a man refuses to sell his convictions, it is not a sacrifice, unless he is the sort of man who has no convictions. Sacrifice could be proper only for those who have nothing to sacrifice, no values, no standards, no judgment, those whose desires are irrational whims, blindly conceived and lightly surrendered. For a man of moral stature, whose desires are born of rational values, Sacrifice is the surrender of the right to the wrong, of the good to the evil. The creed of sacrifice is a morality for the immoral, a morality that declares its own bankruptcy by confessing that it can't impart to men any personal stake in virtues or values, and that their souls are sewers of depravity, which they must be taught to sacrifice. By its own confession, it is impotent to teach men to be good and can only subject them to constant punishment. Are you thinking in some foggy stupor that it's only material values that your morality requires you to sacrifice? And what do you think are material values? Matter has no value except as a means for the satisfaction of human desire. Matter is only a tool of human value. To what service are you asked to give the material tools your virtue has produced? To the service of that which you regard as evil to a principle you do not share, to a person you do not respect, to the achievement of a purpose opposed to your own. Else your gift is not a sacrifice. Your morality tells you to renounce the material world and to divorce your values from matter. A man whose values are given no expression in material form, whose existence is unrelated to his ideals, whose actions contradict his convictions, is a cheap little hypocrite. Yet that is the man who obeys your morality and divorces his values from matter. The man who loves one woman but sleeps with another. The man who admires the talent of a worker but hires another. The man who considers one cause to be just but donates his money to the support of another. The man who holds high standards of craftsmanship but devotes his effort to the production of trash. 
These are the men who have renounced matter, the men who believe that the values of their spirit cannot be brought into material reality. Do you say it is the spirit that such men have renounced? Yes, of course. You cannot have one without the other. You are an indivisible entity of matter and consciousness. Renounce your consciousness and you become a brute. Renounce your body and you become a fake. Renounce the material world and you surrender it to evil. And that is precisely the goal of your morality, the duty that your code demands of you. Give to that which you do not enjoy, serve that which you do not admire, submit to that which you consider evil. Surrender the world to the values of others. Deny, reject, renounce yourself. Yourself is your mind. Renounce it, and you become a chunk of meat ready for any cannibal to swallow. It is your mind that they want you to surrender. All those who preach the creed of sacrifice, whatever their tags or their motives, whether they demand it for the sake of your soul or of your body, whether they promise you another life in heaven or a full stomach on this earth, those who start by saying, it is selfish to pursue your own wishes, you must sacrifice them to the wishes of others, end up by saying, it is selfish to uphold your convictions, you must sacrifice them to the convictions of others. This much is true. The most selfish of all things is the independent mind that recognizes no authority higher than its own and no value higher than its judgment of truth. You are asked to sacrifice your intellectual integrity, your logic, your reason, your standard of truth, in favor of becoming a prostitute whose standard is the greatest good for the greatest number. If you search your code for guidance, for an answer to the question, what is the good, the only answer you will find is the good of others. The good is whatever others wish, whatever you feel they feel they wish, or whatever you feel they ought to feel. The good of others is a magic formula that transforms anything into gold, a formula to be recited as a guarantee of moral glory and as a fumigator for any action, even the slaughter of a continent. Your standard of virtue is not an object, not an act, not a principle, but an intention. You need no proof, no reasons, no success. You need not achieve, in fact, the good of others. All you need to know is that your motive was the good of others, not your own. Your only definition of the good is a negation. The good is the non-good for me. Your code, which boasts that it upholds eternal, absolute, objective, moral values and scorns the conditional, the relative, and the subjective. Your code hands out, as its version of the absolute, the following rule of moral conduct. If you wish it, it's evil. If others wish it, it's good. If the motive of your action is your welfare, don't do it. If the motive is the welfare of others, then anything goes. As this double-jointed, double-standard morality splits you in half, so it splits mankind into two enemy camps. One is you. The other is all the rest of humanity. You are the only outcast who has no right to wish or live. You are the only servant. The rest are the masters. You are the only giver, the rest are the takers. You are the eternal debtor, the rest are the creditors, never to be paid off. You must not question their right to your sacrifice, or the nature of their wishes and their needs. Their right is conferred upon them by a negative, by the fact that they are non-you. For those of you who might ask questions, your code provides a consolation prize, and booby trap. It is for your own happiness, it says, that you must serve the happiness of others, the only way to achieve your joy is to give it up to others. The only way to achieve your prosperity is to surrender your wealth to others. The only way to protect your life is to protect all men except yourself. And if you find no joy in this procedure, it is your own fault and the proof of your evil. If you were good, you would find your happiness in providing a banquet for others and your dignity in existing on such crumbs as they might care to toss you. You who have no standard of self-esteem except the guilt and dare not ask the question. But you know the unadmitted answer. Refusing to acknowledge what you see, what hidden premise moves your world. You know it, not in honest statement, but as a dark uneasiness within you. While you flounder between guilty cheating and grudgingly practicing a principle too vicious to name. I who do not accept the unearned, neither in values nor in guilt... I'm here to ask the question you evaded. 
Why is it moral to serve the happiness of others but not your own? If enjoyment is of value, why is it moral when experienced by others but immoral when experienced by you? If the sensation of eating a cake is of value, why is it an immoral indulgence in your stomach but a moral goal for you to achieve in the stomach of others? Why is it immoral for you to desire but moral for others to do so? Why is it immoral to produce a value and keep it but moral to give it away? And if it is not moral for you to keep a value, why is it moral for others to accept it? If you are selfless and virtuous when you give it, are they not selfish and vicious when they take it? Does virtue consist of serving vice? Is the moral purpose of those who are good self-immolation for the sake of those who are evil? The answer you evade, the monstrous answer, is no. The takers are not evil, provided they did not earn the value you gave them. It is not immoral for them to accept it, provided they are unable to produce it, unable to deserve it, unable to give you any value in return. It is not immoral for them to enjoy it, provided they do not obtain it by right. Such is the secret core of your creed, the other half of your double standard. It is immoral to live by your own effort, but moral to live by the effort of others. It is immoral to consume your own product, but moral to consume the products of others. It is immoral to earn, but moral to mooch. It is the parasites who are the moral justification for the existence of the producers. But the existence of the parasites is an end in itself. It is evil to profit by achievement, but good to profit by sacrifice. It is evil to create your own happiness, but good to enjoy it at the price of the blood of others. Your code divides mankind into two castes and commands them to live by opposite rules. Those who may desire anything and those who may desire nothing. The chosen and the damned, the riders and the carriers, the eaters and the eaten. What standard determines your caste? What pass key admits you to the moral elite? The pass key is lack of value. Whatever the value involves, it is your lack of it that gives you a claim upon those who don't lack it. It is your need that gives you a claim to rewards. If you were able to satisfy your need, your ability annuls your right to satisfy it. But a need you are unable to satisfy gives you first right to the lives of mankind. If you succeed, any man who fails is your master. If you fail, any man who succeeds is your serf. Whether your failure is just or not, whether your wishes are rational or not, whether your misfortune is undeserved or the result of your vices, it is misfortune that gives you a right to rewards. It is pain, regardless of its nature or cause. Pain is a primary absolute that gives you a mortgage on all of existence. If you heal your pain by your own effort, you receive no moral credit. Your code regards it scornfully as an act of self-interest. Whatever value you seek to acquire, be it wealth or food or love or rights, if you acquire it by means of your virtue, your code does not regard it as a moral acquisition. You occasion no loss to anyone. It is a trade, not alms, a payment, not a sacrifice. The deserved belongs in the selfish commercial realm of mutual profit. It is only the undeserved that calls for that moral transaction which consists of profit to one at the price of disaster to the other. To demand rewards for your virtue is selfish and immoral. It is your lack of virtue that transforms your demand into a moral right. A morality that holds need as a claim, holds emptiness, non-existence, as its standard of value. It rewards an absence, a defect. Weakness, inability, incompetence, suffering, disease, disaster, the lack, the fault, the flaw, the zero. Who provides the account to pay these claims? Those who are cursed for being non-zeros, each to the extent of his distance from that ideal. Since all values are the product of virtues, the degree of your virtue is used as the measure of your penalty. The degree of your faults is used as the measure of your gain. Your code declares that the rational man must sacrifice himself to the irrational, the independent man to parasites, the honest man to the dishonest, the man of justice to the unjust, the productive man to thieving loafers, the man of integrity to compromising knaves, 
the man of self-esteem, to sniveling neurotics? Do you wonder at the meanness of soul in those you see around you? The man who achieves these virtues will not accept your moral code. The man who accepts your moral code will not achieve these virtues. Under a morality of sacrifice, the first value you sacrifice is morality. The next is self-esteem. When need is the standard, every man is both victim and parasite. As a victim, he must labor to fill the needs of others, leaving himself in the position of a parasite whose needs must be filled by others. He cannot approach his fellow men except in one of two disgraceful roles. He is both a beggar and a sucker. You fear the man who has a dollar less than you. That dollar is rightfully his. He makes you feel like a moral defrauder. You hate the man who has a dollar more than you. That dollar is rightfully yours. He makes you feel that you are morally defrauded. The man below is a source of your guilt. The man above is a source of your frustration. You do not know what to surrender or demand, when to give and when to grab, what pleasure in life is rightfully yours and what debt is still unpaid to others. You struggle to evade as theory the knowledge that by the moral standard you've accepted, you are guilty every moment of your life. There is no mouthful of food you swallow that is not needed by someone somewhere on earth. And you give up the problem in blind resentment. You conclude that moral perfection is not to be achieved or desired, that you will muddle through by snatching as snatch can, and by avoiding the eyes of the young, of those who look at you as if self-esteem were possible, and they expected you to have it. Guilt is all that you retain within your soul, and so does every other man as he goes past, avoiding your eyes. Do you wonder why your morality has not achieved brotherhood on earth or the goodwill of man to man? The justification of sacrifice that your morality propounds is more corrupt than the corruption it purports to justify. The motive of your sacrifice, it tells you, should be love, the love you ought to feel for every man. A morality that professes the belief that the values of the spirit are more precious than matter. A morality that teaches you to scorn a whore who gives her body indiscriminately to all men. This same morality demands that you surrender your soul to promiscuous love for all comers. As there can be no causeless wealth, so there can be no causeless love or any sort of causeless emotion. An emotion is a response to a fact of reality an estimate dictated by your standards. To love is to value. The man who tells you that it is possible to value without values, to love those whom your praise is worthless, is the man who tells you that it is possible to grow rich by consuming without producing, and that paper money is as valuable as gold. Observe that he does not expect you to feel a causeless fear. When his kind get into power, they are expert at contriving means of terror at giving you ample cause to feel the fear by which they desire to rule you. But when it comes to love, the highest of emotions, you permit them to shriek at you accusingly that you are a moral delinquent if you're incapable of feeling causeless love. When a man feels fear without reason, you call him to the attention of a psychiatrist. You are not so careful to protect the meaning, the nature, and the dignity of love. Love is the expression of one's values, the greatest reward you can earn for the moral qualities you have achieved in your character and person, the emotional price paid by one man for the joy he receives from the virtues of another. Your morality demands that you divorce your love from values and hand it down to any vagrant, not as response to his worth, but as response to his need, not as reward, but as alms, not as a payment for virtues, but as a blank check on vices, your morality tells you that the purpose of love is to set you free of the bonds of morality, that love is superior to moral judgment, that true love transcends, forgives, and survives every manner of evil in its object. And the greater the love, the greater the depravity it permits to the loved. To love a man for his virtues is paltry and human, it tells you. To love him for his flaws is divine. To love those who are worthy of it is self-interest. To love the unworthy is sacrifice. You owe your love to those who don't deserve it, and the less they deserve it, the more love you owe them. The more loathsome the object, the nobler your love. The more unfastidious your love, the greater your virtue. And if you can bring your soul to the state of a dumpy, 
that welcomes anything on equal terms, if you can cease to value moral values, you have achieved the state of moral perfection. Such is your morality of sacrifice, and such are the twin ideals it offers to refashion the life of your body in the image of a human stockyards and the life of your spirit in the image of a dump. Such was your goal, and you've reached it. Why do you now moan complaints about man's impotence and the futility of human aspirations? Because you were unable to prosper by seeking destruction? Because you were unable to find joy by worshipping pain? Because you were unable to live by holding death as your standard of value? The degree of your ability to live was the degree to which you broke your moral code. Yet you believe that those who preach it are friends of humanity. You damn yourself and dare not question their motives or their goals. Take a look at them now, when you face your last choice, and if you choose to perish. Do so with full knowledge of how cheaply, how small an enemy has claimed your life. The mystics of both schools who preach the creed of sacrifice are germs that attack you through a single sore, your fear of relying on your mind. They tell you that they possess a means of knowledge higher than the mind, a mode of consciousness superior to reason, like a special pull with some bureaucrat of the universe who gives them secret tips withheld from others. The mystics of spirit declare that they possess an extra sense you lack, this special sixth sense consists of contradicting the whole of the knowledge of your five. The mystics of muscle do not bother to assert any claim to extrasensory perception. They merely declare that your senses are not valid and that their wisdom consists of perceiving your blindness by some manner of unspecified means. Both kinds demand that you invalidate your own consciousness and surrender yourself into their power. They offer you as proof of their superior knowledge the fact that they assert the opposite of everything you know, and is proof of their superior ability to deal with existence, the fact that they lead you to misery, self-sacrifice, starvation, destruction. They claim that they perceive a mode of being superior to your existence on this earth. The mystics of spirit call it another dimension, which consists of denying dimensions. The mystics of muscle call it the future, which consists of denying the present. To exist is to possess identity. What identity are they able to give to their superior realm? They keep telling you what it is not, but never tell you what it is. All their identifications consist of negating. God is that which no human mind can know, they say, and proceed to demand that you consider it knowledge. God is non-man. Heaven is non-earth. Soul is non-body. Virtue is non-profit. A is non-A. Perception is non-sensory. Knowledge is non-reason. Their definitions are not acts of defining, but of wiping out. It is only the metaphysics of a leech that would cling to the idea of a universe where a zero is a standard of identification. A leech would want to seek escape from the necessity to name its own nature. Escape! from the necessity to know that the substance on which it builds its private universe is blood. What is the nature of that superior world to which they sacrifice the world that exists? The mystics of spirit curse matter. The mystics of muscle curse profit. The first wish men to profit by renouncing the earth. The second wish men to inherit the earth by renouncing all profit. They are non-material, non-profit worlds. A realms where rivers run with milk and coffee where wine spurts from rocks at their command, where pastry drops on them from clouds at the price of opening their mouth. On this material profit-chasing earth, an enormous investment of virtue, of intelligence, integrity, energy, skill, is required to construct a railroad to carry them the distance of one mile. In their non-material, non-profit world, they travel from planet to planet at the cost of a wish. If an honest person asks them, How? They answer with righteous scorn that a how is the concept of vulgar realists. The concept of superior spirits is somehow. On this earth restricted by matter and profit, rewards are achieved by thought. In a world set free of such restrictions, rewards are achieved by wishing. And that is the whole of their shabby secret, the secret of all their esoteric philosophies. 
of all their dialectics and super senses, of their evasive eyes and snarling words, the secret for which they destroy civilization, language, industries, and lives, the secret for which they pierce their own eyes and eardrums, grind out their senses, blank out their minds, the purpose for which they dissolve the absolutes of reason, logic, matter, existence, reality, is to erect upon that plastic fog a single holy absolute, their wish. The restriction they seek to escape is the law of identity. The freedom they seek is freedom from the fact that an A will remain an A no matter what their tears or tantrums, that a river will not bring them milk no matter what their hunger, that water will not run uphill no matter what comforts they could gain if it did. And if they want to lift it to the roof of a skyscraper, they must do it by a process of thought and labor in which the nature of an inch of pipeline counts, but their feelings do not. That their feelings are impotent to alter the course of a single speck of dust in space or the nature of any action they have committed. Those who tell you that man is unable to perceive a reality undistorted by his senses mean that they are unwilling to perceive a reality undistorted by their feelings. Things as they are are things as perceived by your mind. Divorce them from reason and they become things as perceived by your wishes. There is no honest revolt against reason. And when you accept any part of their creed, your motive is to get away with something your reason would not permit you to attempt. The freedom you seek is freedom from the fact that if you stole your wealth, you are a scoundrel. No matter how much you give to charity or how many prayers you recite. That if you sleep with sluts, you're not a worthy husband no matter how anxiously you feel that you love your wife next morning, that you are an entity, not a series of random pieces scattered through a universe where nothing sticks and nothing commits you to anything, the universe of a child's nightmare, where identities switch and swim, where the rotter and the hero are interchangeable parts arbitrarily assumed at will, that you are a man, that you are an entity, that you are, no matter how eagerly you claim that the goal of your mystic wishing is a higher mode of life, the rebellion against identity is the wish for non-existence. The desire not to be anything is the desire not to be. Your teachers, the mystics of both schools, have reversed causality in their consciousness, then strive to reverse it in existence. They take their emotions as a cause and their mind as a passive effect. They make their emotions their tool for perceiving reality. They hold their desires as an irreducible primary, as a fact, superseding all facts. An honest man does not desire until he has identified the object of his desire. He says, it is, therefore I want it. They say, I want it, therefore it is. They want to cheat the axiom of existence and consciousness. They want their consciousness to be an instrument not of perceiving but of creating existence, an existence to be not the object but the subject of their consciousness. They want to be that God they created in their image and likeness, who creates a universe out of a void by means of an arbitrary whim. But reality is not to be cheated. What they achieve is the opposite of their desire. They want an omnipotent power over existence. Instead, they lose the power of their consciousness. By refusing to know, they condemn themselves to the horror of a perpetual unknown. Those irrational wishes that draw you to their creed, those emotions you worship as an idol on whose altar you sacrifice the earth, that dark, incoherent passion within you which you take as the voice of God or of your glands, is nothing more than the corpse of your mind, an emotion that clashes with your reason, an emotion that you cannot explain or control, is only the carcass of that stale thinking which you forbade your mind to revise. Whenever you committed the evil of refusing to think and to see, of exempting from the absolute of reality some one small wish of yours, whenever you chose to say, let me withdraw from the judgment of reason, the cookies I stole, or the existence of God, let me have my one irrational whim and I will be a man of reason about all else. That was the act of subverting your consciousness, the act of corrupting your mind. 
Your mind then became a fixed jury who takes orders from a secret underworld, whose verdict distorts the evidence to fit an absolute it dares not touch. And a censored reality is the result, a splintered reality, where the bits you chose to see are floating among the chasms of those you didn't, held together by that embalming fluid of the mind which is an emotion exempted from thought. The links you strive to drown are causal connections. The enemy you seek to defeat is the law of causality. It permits you no miracles. The law of causality is the law of identity applied to action. All actions are caused by entities. The nature of an action is caused and determined by the nature of the entities that act. A thing cannot act in contradiction to its nature. An action not caused by an entity would be caused by a zero which would mean a zero controlling a thing, a non-entity controlling an entity, the non-existent ruling the existent, which is the universe of your teacher's desire, the cause of their doctrines of causeless action, the reason of their revolt against reason, the goal of their morality, their politics, their economics, the ideal they strive for, the reign of the zero. The law of identity does not permit you to have your cake and eat it too. The law of causality does not permit you to eat your cake before you have it. But if you drown both laws in the blanks of your mind, if you pretend to yourself and to others that you don't see, then you can try to proclaim your right to eat your cake today and mine tomorrow. You can preach that the way to have a cake is to eat it first before you bake it, that the way to produce it is to start by consuming, that all wishers have an equal claim to all things, since nothing is caused by anything. The corollary of the causeless in matter is the unearned in spirit. Whenever you rebel against causality, your motive is the fraudulent desire not to escape it, but worse, to reverse it. You want unearned love, as if love, the effect, could give you personal value, the cause. You want unearned admiration, as if admiration, the effect, could give you virtue, the cause. You want unearned wealth, as if wealth, the effect, could give you ability, the cause. You plead for mercy. Mercy, not justice. As if an unearned forgiveness could wipe out the cause of your plea. And to indulge your ugly little shams, you support the doctrines of your teachers while they run hog wild, proclaiming that spending the effect creates riches, the cause. That machinery, the effect, creates intelligence, the cause. That your sexual desires, the effect, create your philosophical values, the cause. Who pays for the orgy? Who causes the causeless? Who are the victims condemned to remain unacknowledged and to perish in silence, lest their agony disturb your pretense that they do not exist? We are. We, the men of the mind. We are the cause of all the values that you covet. We who perform the process of thinking, which is the process of defining identity, and discovering causal connections. We taught you to know, to speak, to produce, to desire, to love. You who abandon reason, were it not for us who preserve it, you would not be able to fulfill or even to conceive your wishes. You would not be able to desire the clothes that had not been made, the automobile that had not been invented, the money that had not been devised as exchange for goods that did not exist the admiration that had not been experienced for men who had achieved nothing, the love that belongs and pertains only to those who preserve their capacity to think, to choose, to value. You who leap like a savage out of the jungle of your feelings into the Fifth Avenue of our New York and proclaim that you want to keep the electric lights but to destroy the generators. It is our wealth that you use while destroying us. It is our values that you use while damning us. It is our language that you use while denying the mind. Just as your mystics of spirit invented their heaven in the image of our earth, omitting our existence, and promised you rewards created by miracle out of non-matter, so your modern mystics of muscle omit our existence and promise you a heaven where matter shapes itself of its own causeless will into all the rewards desired by your non-mind. For centuries, the mystics of spirit had existed by running a protection racket, by making life on earth unbearable, then charging you 
for consolation and relief by forbidding all the virtues that make existence possible, then riding on the shoulders of your guilt by declaring production and joy to be sins, then collecting blackmail from the sinners. We, the men of the mind, were the unnamed victims of their creed. We who were willing to break their moral code and to bear damnation for the sin of reason. We who thought and acted while they wished and prayed. We who were moral outcasts. We who were bootleggers of life when life was held to be a crime while they basked in moral glory for the virtue of surpassing material greed and of distributing in selfless charity the material goods produced by blank out. Now, we are chained and commanded to produce by savages who do not grant us even the identification of sinners, by savages who proclaim that we do not exist, then threaten to deprive us of the life we don't possess if we fail to provide them with the goods we don't produce. Now we are expected to continue running railroads and to know the minute when a train will arrive after crossing the span of a continent. We are expected to continue running steel mills and to know the molecular structure of every drop of metal in the cables of your bridges and in the body of the airplanes that support you in midair. While the tribes of your grotesque little mystics of muscle fight over the carcass of our world, gibbering in sounds of non-language, that there are no principles, no absolutes, no knowledge, no mind. Dropping below the level of a savage who believes that the magic words he utters have the power to alter reality, they believe that reality can be altered by the power of the words they do not utter. And their magic tool is the blank out, the pretense that nothing can come into existence past the voodoo of their refusal to identify it. As they feed on stolen wealth in body, so they feed on stolen concepts in mind and proclaim that honesty consists of refusing to know that one is stealing. As they use effects while denying causes, so they use our concepts while denying the roots and the existence of the concepts they are using. As they seek not to build but to take over industrial plants, so they seek not to think but to take over human thinking. As they proclaim that the only requirement for running a factory is the ability to turn the cranks of the machines and blank out the question of who created the factory. So they proclaim that there are no entities, that nothing exists but motion, and blank out the fact that motion presupposes the thing which moves, that without the concept of entity, there can be no such concept as motion. As they proclaim their right to consume the unearned, and blank out the question of who's to produce it. So they proclaim that there is no law of identity, that nothing exists but change, and blank out the fact that change presupposes the concepts of what changes, from what and to what, that without the law of identity, no such concept as change is possible. As they rob an industrialist while denying his value, so they seek to seize power over all of existence while denying that existence exists. We know that we know nothing, they chatter, blanking out the fact that they are claiming knowledge. There are no absolutes, they chatter, blanking out the fact that they are uttering an absolute. You cannot prove that you exist or that you're conscious, they chatter, blanking out the fact that proof presupposes existence, consciousness, and a complex chain of knowledge, the existence of something to know, of a consciousness able to know it, and of a knowledge that is learned to distinguish between such concepts as the proved and the unproved. When a savage who has not learned to speak declares that existence must be proved, he is asking you to prove it by means of non-existence. When he declares that your consciousness must be proved, he is asking you to prove it by means of unconsciousness. He is asking you to step into a void outside of existence and consciousness, to give him proof of both. He is asking you to become a zero, gaining knowledge about a zero. When he declares that an axiom is a matter of arbitrary choice and he doesn't choose to accept the axiom that he exists, he blanks out the fact that he has accepted it by uttering that sentence, that the only way to reject it is to shut one's mouth, expound no theories, and die. An axiom is a statement that identifies the base of knowledge and of any further statement pertaining to that knowledge a statement necessarily contained in all others, whether any particular speaker chooses to identify it or not. An axiom is a proposition that defeats its opponents by the fact that they have to accept it and use it in the process of any attempt to deny it. 
Let the caveman who does not choose to accept the axiom of identity try to present his theory without using the concept of identity or any concept derived from it. Let the anthropoid who does not choose to accept the existence of nouns try to devise a language without nouns, adjectives, or verbs. Let the witch doctor who does not choose to accept the validity of sensory perception try to prove it without using the data he obtained by sensory perception. Let the headhunter who does not choose to accept the validity of logic, try to prove it without using logic. Let the pygmy who proclaims that a skyscraper needs no foundation after it reaches its 50th story yank the base from under his building, not yours. Let the cannibal who snarls that the freedom of man's mind was needed to create an industrial civilization, but is not needed to maintain it, be given an arrowhead in bearskin, not a university chair of economics. Do you think they are taking you back to dark ages? They are taking you back to darker ages than any your history has known. Their goal is not the era of pre-science, but the era of pre-language. Their purpose is to deprive you of the concept on which man's mind, his life, and his culture depend. The concept of an objective reality. <laughs>